Good evening, my name is Amy, and today we are talking about something that I never thought I would ever be talking about, which is YA contemporary novels. So, a bit of context. Thanks to my procrastinating ways, I have screwed myself over and I'm now stuck binge reading all these books that I have to read for a work-related assignment whose deadline is rapidly approaching. I don't know about other librarians, but one of the things that we're required to do in my workplace is committee work. I've been involved in this particular committee for a while now, and I won't go into detail about it on the off chance that someone I know or someone who knows about this assignment stumbles upon this video. Highly unlikely, but you know, you never know. I don't think I'm allowed to go into um, the specifics of it, so I'm just not going, I'm just going to gloss right over that. Last year I was in charge of nonfiction books, but this year I'm working with YA, and specifically contemporary YA novels featuring Asian American main characters written by Asian American authors. Very niche category, and one I am completely unfamiliar with. I can, ca I can count on one hand the number of contemporary YA novels that I read over the years that didn't have an element of fantasy or sci-fi in them, because that's another thing. I thought when I was going into this that I would be reading YA sci-fi fantasy novels by Asian American authors, you know, among um, contemporary ones. But nope, it is all contemporary, so yikes! To say I'm reading outside of my comfort zone would be putting it lightly. I didn't even read contemporary YA back when I was a white a myself, um, and now I'm getting along in years, and I'm still allergic to romance, so I basically can't stand it unless there's something else going on, and with most of these books in the stack that I have here, it does not seem like that's the case. But for the sake of this assignment, I am trying my best to be fair and objective, so I've decided the only way I can properly do my job is if I read all these books as if I am a neighborhood auntie, listening to gossip about my acquaintances' teenage children. I'm naturally nosy, so I believe this is going to make everything much easier for me to stomach. So let's get started. The first book I read was Parachutes by Kelly Yang, and I actually get to hold up a print book for this video because all the books that I was assigned I got sent for free, which uh, is rather unfortunate because I don't know what I'm going to do with them once I'm done. Like, I don't even own a bookshelf, and I'm not about to build one just for this, so... And so yeah, like I, I guess I, I'll just donate them to my own library once I'm done. Um, getting a bit off topic, so this book is about a about two girls actually. The first one is a rich Chinese girl named Claire who, um, after getting shitty grades in one of her classes, gets shipped off to California by her parents. Uh, they're just afraid that she's not going to be able to get into a good college, not going to be successful in the future. Um, not going to be able to find a good husband, so on and so forth. Like, basically, so much of um, your future is decided by what you do now in the present. And um, so so they decide that in order to ensure that she doesn't screw herself over, she needs to go and get a fashionable, expensive education abroad. I'm going to explain the term parachutes real quick. It basically refers to kids like Claire, who are sent abroad to attend school by their rich parents, who usually still remain in Asia to work or whatever, and they get to tell all their friends that they have a child studying overseas. I went to school with several parachutes, uh, coincidentally also in Southern California, but I didn't know the term back then, I don't even know if it existed back in the day, but they were all from wealthy backgrounds from what I can recall, and they were all very generous with their money. They struggled a lot with how different like the culture back in their home countries was compared to the culture here. There are a lot of stories uh, that I heard about having to like re-acclimate, I guess, to a place like whenever you came back home for winter break and then um, had to return here for school afterwards. I imagine it couldn't have been easy and Claire, one of, like I said, one of the two main characters, like she really, really does not want to go to America. Like she has absolutely no interest in it at the very beginning of the book. She has a boyfriend and a life in Shanghai where she's from and um, she speaks perfect English because her family has a Filipino housekeeper that's been conversing with her ever since she was a kid and um, that should make it easier, like, because, you know, they're, they're China rich, so she can afford everything that she wants, um, which should sh soften the blow of having to go abroad um, against her will. But when she arrives at the private school that her father chose for her, she realizes that the international students like her are assigned to different classes from the American ones. Like, they're, for example, in a super easy English class. And despite the fact that 
most of them are from wealthy families like Claire is, and they all speak English really well. And Claire ends up making friends with the queen bees of the international student crowd. There's Jess, Nancy, and Florence, who are all good-looking, fashionable, very rich. However, her parents chose a Filipino host family for her so that she can feel more at home, since, like I said before, she grew up with a Filipino housekeeper. This family comes from a completely different world than Claire does. The daughter of the family is a girl Claire's age named Danny, and Danny is the second protagonist of this novel. Danny's dad walked out on her mom when her mom was still pregnant with her. So she and her mom have been trying really hard ever since to keep afloat. Her mom works for um, a house cleaning company as a maid, and Danny herself works shifts for this company with her best friend after school so that she can fund her debate trips because Danny's on the debate team and they have to take some trips out of state sometimes for competitions. They She gets, attends the same school as Claire, but is a scholarship student, so she has trouble fitting in uh, because of that. She is brilliant and is also the star of her debate team, but her teammates are from privileged backgrounds, so their parents can afford to hire private debate coaches for them who actually write their debate speeches for them and feed them lines before their competitions. And I know this is stuff that probably goes on in the real world all the time, like rich people paying other people to write, like, cover letters and everything for their, their children, while Danny and the, most of the rest of us, I imagine, um, have to get by on our own. So when she and Claire first meet, they don't really get along, which isn't surprising, but they do grudgingly admire each other. Like Danny thinks that Claire is super confident, fashionable, like a celebrity, and Claire loves that Danny is smart and great with debate and gets to, like she knows what she wants to do with her life. Like Claire mentions that she has always had her life um, decided for her by committee, like her parents, her grandmother, her aunts. Like she doesn't really get to make many decisions on her own, as evidenced by getting sent, her getting sent to California, even though she didn't want to come. Like she, she really likes to swim, but her mom was afraid that if she swam too much, her muscles would grow too big, so she made her quit the team, and that was the main, one thing that Claire loved about school. So um, I don't want to give too much away, but I will say this book surprised me. Like, I expected a typical YA friendship story going in. You know, like the typical one where, like, they don't get along, they live together, learn to communicate, uh, become best friends, like, yay, everyone's happy. But when I opened the book, there was a trigger warning at the front for rape, so I knew it was going to get dark eventually, but it went way into the issues that we've seen floating around on the internet a lot since the Me Too movement. I knew it was hard to get your rapist removed from their position or from your school if you're a student, especially if you're at a prestigious school or if your rapist is wealthy and powerful. But it's ridiculous to me, like just how hard it is. Like I found out Kelly Yang based this on her own experience trying to get justice after she was raped while she was a student at Harvard Law School. And how everybody nitpicked at her story and authority figures that should have been sympathetic to her and should have been trying their best to help her get justice, kept asking her, like, are you sure you want to pursue this? Like, you know it's going to be a long and hard and stressful process. I gave this book four out of five stars. Like, I didn't love it. I had pr some problems with the way the characters handled certain things, and there were parts that just dragged for me because they were um, going on dates, going out partying. I felt like an aunt chaperoning my teenage niece while she was out uh, with her new boyfriend or hanging out with her friends and making all these poor decisions. But I do think it's an important book to read and it explores some sensitive topics. Young women have to know that they're not alone and I think this is a good book to remind them of that. Like, that's the thing, one thing I really liked about this book. The girls in here are very supportive of each other. There's some cattiness, but they're teenagers at a private school so I'm not very surprised about that. But even the girls I expected to be, like Regina George and the Plastics from Mean Girls, were solid in the end. Like, they're good friends, and um, and I'm glad that they, they had each other, because the adults in this book were just terrible role models. Like, there were two adults that I can remember that were cool, and there were a lot of adults that appeared. So I don't know what that says about us, like, us old people, <laughs> at least in the eyes of a teenager. I think being a teenager is very lonely in a way, so having a dependable adult who's got your back when you're that age really means a lot. And I can't believe that I'm at that point in my life where I have to be the adult figure in someone else's life, by the way. That's just 
that, that's so much for me. Like, ugh, I, I cannot um, come to terms with my own age. So, um, anyways, next book that I read was Anna Kay by Jenny Lee. Now, this book has the words, a love story printed right on the cover. So when I saw that right away, I just went, oh, <laughs> but I gathered my strength and I dived straight into it. This book is a YA adaptation of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. I have actually never read Anna Karenina because it just never really interested me, even back when I was going through my classics phase. But, and, and plus my dad spoiled the ending for it when I was 14, so I just didn't bother reading it because I already knew what was going to happen. Anyways, Anna Kane here is a half-white, half-Korean uh, socialite, and I don't really know what it is with all these like rich Asian YA characters. Like, is this a thing recently? Like, is this just like what's popular now? I wouldn't really know because back when I was a teenager, there were really no Asian American YA characters that I could think of. Anyways, Cl um, not Claire. <laughs> Anna and her brother Stephen are the children of a wealthy businessman who came from like, a lot of money back in Korea. And um, his wife, who is a, a socialite who's from old money in New York. So needless to say, they draw a lot of attention everywhere they go. They're, they're both good looking, they wear expensive clothes, Stephen is known for throwing these giant parties that everybody wants to be invited to. Anna rides horses, like she owns two horses and she uh, competes. She also owns like show dogs that she enters into competitions. She attends high school in Connecticut so that she can live at her family's house out there because it's farther away from the city and she gets to be close to the stables and she gets to have a big backyard for her dogs. And her family lives in a penthouse in the city in New York. So I just can't even imagine this level of wealth because I'm from a working class neighborhood and I can't even afford a first class plane ticket. So I can't even, um, like much less first class tickets and private jets and all the things that these kids just have access to every day. This book reminds me of Gossip Girl, actually. Uh, it's got that same kind of style of humorous writing that sounds like somebody's just saying, hey, have you heard? Like, <laughs> like, like, it, like, it's that kind of writing style. And there are all these details about the brands that everyone's wearing, um, like what everyone's like, oh, what parties everyone's going to. And I just didn't really care. But I get that if you're from that world, you probably have to care, at least to some extent. Um, although the main character, Anna, apparently stands out because, according to everybody, she's just super beautiful, but in a natural way. Like, everyone says that they say she walks in her room and all the other girls just look plain in comparison. And she doesn't even try. It's very effortless beauty, which is super chic. And uh, she also doesn't seem to care about all the frivolous things that the other rich kids think about. Like, she's not like the other girls, which uh, draws like all the boys to her, and everyone likes her because she's just a really nice girl. Like I actually think that I would want to be her friend too if I went to school with her and everything. Like she's just a perfect girl, and she's also dating this college guy named Alexander, who is considered the perfect boyfriend and perfect future son-in-law by like all the society matrons and everything. <laughs> Basically, they're just a very boring couple. But then. Anna meets Alexia Vronsky, who is this super good-looking fuckboy who's also from the same social circles as them, but the two of them fall in love at first sight, and then all this shit goes down afterward. Expectations are shattered, lives are ruined, like you, as you can imagine, like, for, like all these wasps and all these rich people, they have their lives laid out for them. And this affair just gets in the way. If you have read Anna Karenina, you're probably not going to be surprised by much, but since I never read it, I was shocked by some of the things that went down. I gave this book 3.5 out of 5 stars. Again, I'm trying to be objective and fair here. I think I would have liked this book way more if I were into contemporary YA and romance. I would give the same sc score regardless, because like I said, I'm being fair, but my enjoyment level would have been higher. I also am very bo bothered by infidelity and love triangles in books, and there is so much infidelity and so many love triangles in here. Also, actually, also in um, Parachutes, but in here it's like way, way, way more prevalent. And in fact, the, it, some of them became love squares, some of them became love polygons. Like I guess when you're just dating from amongst, like you know, a small group of rich East Coast teenagers, you're you don't have many options. You're bound to overlap with someone sooner or later. But despite my annoyance. I totally got why Anna was into Alexia. Like, I know everyone thought that she threw away this perfect relationship, but I, I honestly think that it was really creepy how... So when she... Basically, Alexander, her original boyfriend, 
saw her playing violin when she was 13 years old and he was 16. And he basically got his parents and her parents to agree to let him date her. And I know she herself agrees to it, but she was 13 at the time. Like, what the hell did she know? So from that moment on, her identity just became Alexander's girlfriend. Like, she almost didn't have her own identity. And she was so young at the time, and her life was basically already decided for her. Like, at the point we meet, like, by the point time, by the time we meet her at the beginning of the book, like, she, everybody pretty much expects her to get married to Alexander. So as I read more and more, I ended up feeling very sorry for her. And like, I didn't think I would, but like, I thought, like, I highly doubt she knows it herself, but her life really sucks. <laughs> I would never want to be her. This review ended up getting very long, so I'm going to end the video here. I have many more books to get through in the stack, like I said before, so I'm probably, probably going to make this into a series that I upload in chunks as I make my way through the pile. I'm going to create a new playlist for it and everything because it's just so different from any of the other stuff I'm reading. But yeah, I'm just gonna end right there and have a good night everyone. Bye!